you know, museums are not stagnant institutions and we in continue to learn and, and develop and interpret history or figures. And technology has just over the years made that su is such an important component of uh, uh, research. As you know, many of you could get interlibrary loans of, of uh, real to real tape to go through archives and now things are at our fingertips thanks to digitization and uh, uh, it, it allows us to uh, not only protect objects begin to develop more and more the um, the stories behind them and look uh, today i want to look at three different items or uh, from three different sources that are part of our dolly madison collection so just for a moment let me talk excuse me, talk about Dolly. Just some highlights, but born uh, May 20th, 1768, the third child of John Payne and Mary Coles, and she was born in Guilford County, so North Carolina's only first lady. Her parents had moved here from Virginia in 1765 and purchased 280 acres of land, became members of New Garden Friends, and um, but Dolly would grow up in Virginia and then at 15, uh, where the family had grown to a family of 10 or having eight children. Repeat over and over again, what you heard before. Would, um, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, would make Philadelphia their home. Uh, she married twice, she had children, she remained close to her family and married 42 years to James Madison, who was 17 years her senior. He was a Senator, Secretary of State, and fourth president. And she is known as one of the most popular first ladies, uh, was mistress to Montpelier, the 5,000 acre um, home of the Madison family. And so that's quite a nutshell for her life. Uh, she was much more complex and deep, but as we look at these items, I'll talk a little bit more about her life. The museum's Dolly Madison collection is nationally significant thanks to generosity and efforts of local citizens and descendants and donors. Uh, the first item we received was 1951 and up through 2013 we've added items that shed light on Dolly and her family and the events that happened during her lifetime. Her friendships and the people she knew, and even how she continues to be honored today. An example in the collection would be the U.S. stamp, stamp that uh, has her image. Um, so for 66 years, our collection's grown. Um, and the information we receive is the starting point for the research that we broaden and that we continue. It's a continuous process. Um, and, and Dolly, the interest in Dolly never ends. Um, I have lists of people from Eleanor Fox Pearson up to Catherine Al Gore, the uh, historian, who uh, have had an interest in our collection and will uh, continue to and write. What I have here, what you see on the screen, are two examples of sort of the documents that are starting points. Um, one is the catalog uh, from 1899 of the uh, auction of Madison things, which would become sort of the core of what we call our Kunkel collection. Uh, next to it is an old catalog card. Uh, it says 1961, but this is of the silk dress. This is actually the first item we got that had a connection to Dolly. And as you see, it has a typed card that says worn by Dolly Payne Madison at the time she was Mrs. John Todd. So these are some starting points. We also have catalog records and uh, family folklore as well. So let's look at the first object. Now, this is kind of an unusual thing. Uh, and in 19... Um, this is from the Kunkel collection. Uh, in 1963, after the efforts and acquisition of a family collection by the Dolly Madison Association, which formed in the late 1950s, the museum acquired the Kunkel collection from the association. 
uh, the items in the collection descended through Dolly's niece, Anna Costin, the daughter of her younger brother, John, and um, then down through the lines from, um, well, there's lots of story there. Uh, Dolly, Dolly's death, confusion with the will, her son Payne, who was uh, always into trouble, her niece Anna, who looked after her later in life. Uh, the, the sale uh, was held by uh, Costin's daughter in 1899. And uh, then the items that didn't sell or that they kept went to her son and uh, John Kunkel and his wife, Neva. And they turned up in a, it's a terrific story about these national treasures found in the eaves of an attic in a rural area of Pennsylvania. And there's a great story of the fundraisers that the ladies and, and gentlemen in Greensboro raised the funds to purchase. And then of course in 63 donated. So here's a bone fish hook. And here's a, in the, if you look at the second line in the catalog, it says primitive pearl bone fish hook used by the Indians. That's what we know. And actually, uh, when the, cat, the collection was starting to get cataloged, there were a number of these sort of lackluster, not as glamorous as the clothing or the Tunisian mantle or some other things, uh, portraits uh, that kind of got put to the wayside. So it really wasn't until the 90s that we started to look at some of these objects uh, to try to develop the story around them. Um, so here's what we knew. Uh, why, fish, why fish hook? Why did Dolly keep the fish hook? Um, so I started looking for 19th century bone indigenous or Native Indian fish hooks and was so pleasantly surprised. I was able to place the style of the fish hook. It's uh, some call it a bonita hook, uh, a trolling hook. And it was made from bone shell and the twine is is uh is plant fiber um and in some instances on some islands or some it's a coconut plant fiber but it's a very healthy sturdy fiber and uh you can uh, that has lasted uh through time um when i began to look for these bone, i was able to find these examples that were almost identical to the one in the collection. And this is uh, the Alan Clare collection. Of, this is an individual who has an extensive collection of different types of Polynesian or South Pacific types of fish lures and, and hooks. I found uh, similar ones in the uh, Otago Museum, the British Museum and auction houses, and even in the Journal of the Polynesian Society. Uh, there's a whole section in uh, identifying these hooks. Um, so here we have, we've locked this in um, to the provenance of the South Pacific. And one thing that kept coming up over and over again were the Marquesa Islands. So this is the hook, South Pacific, it's Polynesian. We know it's kind of in the 1800 to 1813 date range. So. I got my passport and I went to the Marquesa Islands. Um, the Marquesa Islands had an indigenous people. Uh, the first Western visitor was uh, documented as a Spanish in the 16th century. And it was settled by the French. Uh, and these islands are located in the Southern Pacific Ocean they're like 840 miles northeast of Tahiti and 3,000 miles west of Mexico. Uh, one of the things that intrigues me is just thinking about ships and people navigating around the, uh, what is it, the Cape of uh, Cape Horn or, and traveling these seas. But uh, we also know that the first American visitor was a fur trader Joseph Ingraham in 1791. Um, and he came into this island in the Marquesa Islands called Nukahiva, and he named it Washington Island. Uh, and this area, 
uh, became a port of call for a lot of whaling vessels to come into shore to do repairs. Um, so there's an image of the islands today, and actually there's, there's lots of things have been, this, these islands have inspired literature. Uh, I think there was even a series of the uh, survivors filmed on one of the islands, but uh, they were new to me. And then to find this additional information was even uh, more exciting. This image of one of the indigenous people, they love tattoos, they had a, a very unique hairstyle, uh, and this artwork was actually done. I want you to sort of remember this because we're going to talk about this in a second uh, by a, another group of, of uh, I think maybe from Russia, if I recall, who did a series of drawings and documentation on these islands um, and, and research. So this is uh, an example. But let's look at this picture at the bottom, uh, the black and white drawing. Uh, in 1813, Captain David Porter sailed into port on the USS Essex, and that was a flagship of like 10 ships for repairs before continuing his raid against British shipping and whaling vessels. He named Nukahiva Madison's Island because Madison was president at this time. And in November, uh, because I guess when you went into a port of call to do repairs, it wasn't like a few hours you waited. I think you had some time to spend. In November, he constructed a fort with four cannons and raised the American flag, and he named the fort Fort Madison. <laughs> now, this was the first naval base in the U.S. Pacific Ocean, and maybe a little bit lackluster because uh, where, you know, why was he compelled to create a fort in such a short amount of time? Um, you know, it was to protect uh, the village. There were some from British, and then there was lots of things going on with the various tribes on the Marquesa Islands. Um, but there was one incident that's documented with British mutineers in 1814, but the fort was soon abandoned after that as um, Captain Porter got back on task of chasing British ships. So let's get, let's just, who is this Porter, Porter fellow? Let's talk about him for just a minute because all of this is building a stronger and stronger reason for us to, or better understand, why is this Marquesa Island, Nukahiva, Bone Tooth in the Madison collection? Some of this we're starting to answer, some we may not answer. But um, he had, this is a, he, uh, David Porter was a U.S. Uh, Navy officer who was the rank of captain and eventually got the honorary uh, name of Commodore. He was involved, he's another person, you should jot his name down and read about his um, escapades. But he was uh, commanded the USS Constitution and the USS Essex. He saw service in the first Barbary War. He was actually taken prisoner in Tripoli in 1803 and five. And if you remember the whole first, when Melly Melly came to the states to sort of negotiate how we were going to pay for prisoners and people they captured and protect ships. All this was also going on. Well, he was one of the naval officers who was actually uh, out in the ocean and in, in that Barbary Coast area. Um, he was involved in the War of 1812 and in 1815, James appointed him to the Navy Board. Um, and uh, we have some correspondence that goes into that. We know that he sailed to the islands for the, and um, he had kind of an interesting sidetrack because at some point he decided to avenge a, a fellow officer in Puerto Rico. It wasn't sanctioned. He was court-martialed, he resigned, and he became the uh, commander of the chief of the Mexican Navy from 1826 to 29. But then in 29, all was, I guess, straightened out when he became the U.S. minister to the Barbary states, and he was there and then in residence in the Ottoman Empire until his death in uh, 1843. So he served 
for 27 years in the US Navy. Um, but with all of that, I think it's fascinating that he was married, he lived in Pennsylvania and he had 10 children. So I don't know how he worked it all in. He must have tons of energy. But one of his six sons became David Dixon Porter, who became uh, an admiral in the US Navy. So the Madison papers at the University of Virginia are another tremendous resource for research. So armed with the things that we've learned, I went to these archives, which is digitized and put in David Porter's name and James Madison's name and came up with some uh, interesting correspondence and I was going to too that that kind of lend themselves to uh, this the thoughts of perhaps this was brought to Madison uh, by Porter or someone who had visited the islands. Um, in, eight, in January, this is a July quote, but in January of 1815, uh, Porter presented Madison with a copy of his journal of his cruise of the Essex and uh, as a token of respect. Um, and this was about the time he was assigned to the Naval Board by Madison. Uh, and then he writes him again in October and he is excited to ask President, to ask Madison, he, it, Porter's proposing a voyage of discovery to the North and South Pacific Oceans. And he points out works of other countries and uh, he's so excited and I'm gonna quote something. He says, everything now favors the object. The world is at peace. We have come honorable out of two naval wars. We have ships which require little or no expense. Officers will soon require employment and who would greatly benefit by the experience and, and me of talents in every part of the US who would take pride in placing their nation in the eminence of others. And by eminence of others, he's talking about, remember the sketch I showed you of the indigenous native and uh, he wanted to go back and, uh, and do the scientific types of documentation, anthropological or that uh, for these islands. Um, don't think that happened, but uh, as you see here later, I guess uh, Madison was in, at Montpelier. He wrote to say that he had received the specimen of carved work in the war club from the Pacific Ocean, which you put into the hands of my son-in-law. Um, and I tender my sincere thanks. And he goes on to invite uh, Porter and his wife to come visit at Montpelier. Then there's additional correspondence into the 20s, uh, 1820s. But what we've done is we've taken a fish bone hook used by Indians that didn't sell that ended up in the trunk in the attic of a, of a Madison descendant. So I guess we've learned a lot, but what we don't know is why was the why was that piece of uh, tooth or excuse me the hook kept was it uh well maybe we won't know but we can we have learned a lot um maybe it was always on james's desk to hold down his papers maybe it was just uh, uh something that was important and, and meant something to madison uh it was sentimental these are some of the answers that we may never know but let's talk about another thing now. So line, the first item that um, came uh, to the museum was from a descendant of Dolly and it was a silk gown. And if, if you look here, there's a, the uh, card again, it came from a, a direct descendant of one of her sisters. And that's a picture of the gown when it, it, it first came to Greensboro that almost looks like the uh, Tate Walsh dining room background, but I'm not sure about that. And then to the right, you see the uh, replica that we had made because uh, it's a very, very, the dress is in very, very delicate shape. Here's what we know. and what we love. Dolly had three sisters, Lucy, Anna, and Mary. Here's Lucy and her first husband, uh, George Steptoe Washington. And then that's Anna in the portrait uh, below. Haven't found an image of her youngest sister, Mary. Uh, and sometimes they called Mary Polly. 
but this gown was given to the museum by descendant of Mary. Um, Mary, the youngest sister. And here's what we know in trying to connect the story of, of the dress and the family lore or story. We know that Mary was Dolly's youngest sister. She was present at the marriage of Dolly to her first husband, John Todd, in 1790. And she was also present at the wedding of James and Dolly in 1794. And they married at the home of her sister, uh, Lucy. Um, yes, yes, Lucy uh, and uh, the Madisons did. Um, and we also know that in the year 1800, after receiving blessing, Mary married John G. Jackson, who was a congressman. She married at Montpelier. She was given away by James. Uh, the families were close. The Jacksons were political allies of the Madisons. And like I said, the sisters were always close. And there's a lot of, there's a number of correspondences within all the sisters uh, that are fascinating to read. <laughs> Mary Payne, a Dolly's mother, lived with Mary during her final years. Mary uh, passed away young in 1808, and she had three daughters, and two of them also. One passed away a couple years before her, and one also died in 1808. Um, but she had one daughter, Mary Payne uh, Allen, uh, who married Edward Moore. Their son, Edward Moore, married Elma Radford, and their daughter, Elma Moore, married Mr. E.S. E. Arthur of Greensboro. And the, the originally pink or peach Charmy's dress had been passed down in the family. It was loaned to the museum in 51, and it was made a gift by Mrs. Arthur in 61, right before we received the Kunkel collection. So we've got some idea of who the players are in this. But one of the things that's important to do is to um, look for, uh, and let me back up because I'm still looking. There's supposedly a, uh, uh, some letters or a description or a little more background on the history from Miss Arthur, which I'm, I'm still trying to track down. Uh, uh, and I wanna just point this out. Uh, could it be early enough to have been worn by Dolly during her marriage to, to, in Philadelphia to Todd? Now we know she is a Quaker, but the Philadelphia Quakers uh, dressed in high style, nice fabrics and things like that. Uh, he was an attorney, a successful attorney. They had an, a lovely home. So could this, you know, this could have been a dress that she wore in those years. Um, now, we, we're, we're going to hope that we're going to think that it was not a wedding worn as a wedding dress. Uh, there's documentation, which I'm trying, I will be tracking down that says Mary's gown, uh, wedding gown was cut up during the Civil War by her, uh, I think it would be her granddaughter, uh, to make silk handkerchiefs um, for soldiers. Uh, I read, and then there are two documents to read that are in uh, early, early Clarksville Intelligent newspaper, Intelligence or newspaper, and recounts the wedding of Mary Payne Jackson to John Allen in 1824. So there are some more sort of uh, keys or, or pieces to sort of confirm or, or deny. Um, but let's look at the gown style. So uh, that's kind of where we are. We need to sort of see if we can place this gown in the uh, uh, time frame that is proposed by the family. Um, this woman playing the harp gives you an idea of the period right before what's called Regency. This is uh, the directoire, but I want you to look at the sleeve and, and um, uh, just a little bit about, well, really the sleeve, a little bit about the length of the back. Uh, if you look at the, um, the dress on the right, you see another early uh, example of Regency style and the popularity of wearing that over the red 
If you look to the harp, you see the little striped sort of overdress. Um, the image in the center is the reproduction, which is uh, a, a very accurate reproduction uh, that was done in the 80s. I think it was the 80s. Um, and using the same silk and the same similar color of the dress when it came. Um, so that's just, and I have conservation of this gown because we'll talk about that in the next one. Um, here are some examples of, again, looking at, at line. This, this, all four, most, all four of these are our, our dress today. I put in this printed fabric dress because of the red lines so that you could see um, uh, that's one of the most characteristic patterns is the back of the dress. The narrow panel at the bottom, the sleeves are set far back on the, in the back. And the earlier dress is closed in the front. And if you look at the smaller picture on the far right and the little red line, you see the lacing there in the front. Um, white was a suitable color. It wasn't necessarily a wedding color. Really Queen Victoria sort of made that uh, almost given. Uh, and also we know this dress was a pale peach color when it came to us in uh, uh, the, the late 1950s um, or the, the earlier 1950s. Uh, and pastels were most often used for younger women. And this dress is smaller, uh, although uh, I imagine you stood up quite straight with shoulders down and back when you wore them. And also, if you look, there were short trains were common by the late 1790s, the shorter train. So these are some indications on the piece itself that sort of begin to make us consider, and you see a little bit of the peach color in the folds of the back of the dress at the top. Um, so we've had these points to consider, but have no fear, help is on the way. Uh, and we had some great help in 2013. Uh, Dr. Uh, Anne Bissonette, a professor at the University of Canada in Alberta, was studying a very specific type of transitional dress in the late 1790s to the early 1800s. Uh, she traveled to Europe. She traveled around the country. She still has some things to continue to look at, but here's her findings. Uh, and these to me are things that really help us in trying to define the dress. Um, she looked at the dress as if it were in, in its original form and then how it might have been modified for later wear um, because that's kind of the research she was doing. Is this dress original? Does it have some slight changes? And this is what she, these are her summaries and I'm going to try to go through them really quickly just because I um, think they help us so much to maybe make this one of the earliest pieces, maybe that even pre predates Matt, her uh, time uh, with Madison. She said in its earliest form, it would date before 1794. She married Todd in 1790. Um, uh, and so she had a couple options for the earliest form. Okay. Um, it may have been made during her first marriage to prosperous John Todd, uh, or during her maidenhood as a restrained Quaker young woman of the upper class into the late 1780s. Because of the front lace closure and the very narrow back, and it is very narrow if you look at the print, you see the difference in the width at the back pattern. Um, it could, and uh, it could fit a very young body she opts for the 1780s, the late 1780s. In looking at it as though it were modified or updated to be worn again, it likely dates no earlier than 1794 and no later than 1799. Again, so option one for that was uh, 1797, 1801 is when retirement of the Madisons to Virginia 
or it was modified during her widowhood from Todd in 1793 before her September 1794 remarriage to James Madison when her inheritance isn't settled and finances are a concern because that was something she dealt with at that time. Um, as fashion appears to have great interest to Dolly, she was looking at option two, that this might have been modified uh, after the death of uh, her uh, first husband. Uh, there are some dresses in Boston, there's a dress in Boston that needs to be looked at. And so what do we think or what do we want to know? It is early and uh, it's probably worn by Dolly, but it could be a dress worn by her younger sister, Mary, or modified to fit her. She married in 1800, remember, at Montpelier. Uh, the change in the, uh, the cutting of the dress and historical sketches, or, um, and then there's also things like looking at the dried peas that are the covered buttons or and correspondence between daughters and the weddings and discussions with Dr. Bissonette. And she still owes us her final document. But I feel that this now takes, we are a little bit closer to saying that this is an extremely early piece. Why Mary? And of course, Mary, uh, we know they were close. They corresponded. They saw each other often. Some reason this family kept this dress with this story of belonging to Dolly. The last item we're going to look at is a snuff box. Um, what we know is that this is a uh, sterling that um, it has engraved on the back this date, May 20th, and we know it has this little repose uh, uh, image of Dolly on the lid. And uh, we received this in 2000 from an individual who saw it and purchased it for the museum, knowing about our collection. And, and uh, it's Harold Carpenter, some of you may know. Harold and um, knew it would be a significant piece to add to our collection. So we know that and on the bottom it also says Dolly Madison breakfast. And we also know something I didn't put up here. Dolly liked snuff. And so we know snuff was a, a, a pulverized type of tobacco popular in the 1600s, especially popular in the 1700s. Uh, and um, it could come in different grades, uh, scents, flavored, uh, powder form. Uh, people thought so highly of snuff that they would give uh, boxes as gifts. Um, so I'm veering just a little bit. And Dolly is even known to have said uh, that she had two handkerchiefs, sort of a bandana that she, after she did snuff, she'd use uh, to clean up. And then she had a kerchief, which we have some beautiful handkerchiefs in our collection that she used for the dainty work or the delicate work. I wanted to show you this snuff box because this came in in 1977 and it is connected to Dolly. Um, and the donor is again, a family a descendant, Richard Cutts Story. And he received the snuff box from his aunt and his aunt's grandfather was Richard uh, D. Cutts, the nephew of Dolly's and the youngest child of her sister, Anna and Richard Cutts. And the story is that it's thought to have been given to Martha by Ms. Martha Hackley by Miss Madison, who married this Richard D. Cutts in 1845. And it's beautiful mother of pearl and gold, rose gold and silver snuff box. So back to 1912. The silver snuff box, it turns out, was a favor given to nearly 500 women who attended a May 20th, Dolly's birthday breakfast called the Dolly Madison Harmony Breakfast in Washington to celebrate, and it celebrated Dolly's birthday, her political importance, and among the more than 500 attendees were women with ties to political families of the day. The breakfast highlighted the collective power 
of women eager for their voices to be heard, their voice, their votes to be counted. Newspapers across the country covered the event. Uh, it was the Washington Evening Star announced wives of prominent Democrats to have harmony breakfast, just like the men, uh, which was a good sign of the times. Although the Democratic Party was the least enthusiastic about uh, the women's movement at the time, the 1912 election was the first time the Democratic National Convention authorized and supported an appeal to women. Uh, there's a great book, We Will Be Heard, Women's Struggles for Political Power by Joe Freeman. And it lifts up this event in one section, like uh, uh, so that this box represents Dolly and her accomplishments and the honors uh, her for the struggle and the, that the struggles continued into the 20th century. Uh, the two women that are pictured here are Miss Norman E. Mack and Miss Laura Merriman. And Miss Mack was the wife of, <clears throat> excuse me, political leader Norman Mack. He was editor of the Buffalo Times and chairman of the uh, uh, Democratic National Convention from, I think, 1901 to about 1912. Always involved in politics and a friend to many of the, the fellow ladies and what Catherine Al Gore referred to as parlor politics. Um, other, okay, uh, other women in attendance was like this Anna uh, Mary Cutts, who was a great niece of Dolly's, who wrote, I think, wrote a book or a biography, but sort of peppered it with things that aren't always accurate, but wanted to keep. Uh, her honor and her life alive because of the end of her life. I think a lot of things went awry and she wanted to make sure she was honored correctly. Other people that attended, other women, was like there was a Nellie Fassett from New York who was an active political organizer and a friend of William Jennings Bryant. The breakfast gift, uh, this snuff box, it allows us to revisit political Dolly uh, and again, acknowledge her gifts and accomplishments. And it allows us to look at the events and the importance of the suffrage movement for equality. Uh, other women there were mis and this is the fascinating part and what could go on forever, were to look at all the women and their roles at the time in uh, women's movements and political uh, arenas as well. Ms. Champ Clark was uh, a very active member and was an 36th Speaker of the House, her husband of Representatives, 1911 to 19, Ms. Williams Jennings Bryant, Ms. Adelaide Stevenson, Mrs. Grover Cleveland, Mrs. Woodrow Wilson, and the list goes on from across the country. The picture on the left is Ms. William Dennis, Ms. Chase Riker, and Ms. Mann Barker. And it looks like the woman in the center is wearing an outfit from probably the 1850s. It's very much, so I don't know if, and she has her dark curls as well. So I'm wondering if she came to look closer to Dolly, but the fashion is so, as an aside, the fashion is amazing. So again, what a treasure the Dolly collection is for the museum. There's so many amazing people that value her, her story, so the information and the perspectives continue to evolve. She was a, wasn't just a, a one-dimensional person and the stories, you, and you can, um, you know, Montpelier has a wonderful website. Like I said, the University Archives of Virginia, the Madison Papers, wonderful resource. Um, but I'll sort of close this with author and historian Catherine Al Gore, because I thought she put it really well that uh, within a few years, she, meaning Dolly, had mastered both the social and political intricacies of the city, and by her death in 1849 was the most celebrated person in Washington. And I think we celebrate her even today. <laughs>